So welcome. My name is Dan Dennehy, and I'm the head of visual resources and the senior photographer at Minneapolis Institute of Art. For anyone who's not visited the museum yet, you'll have a chance tonight at the opening reception. Um, it's our 100th birthday this year. We've gotten, yeah, we've gotten really good at, uh, at celebrating, so we're looking forward to um, having you at the museum. I wanted to uh, also mention, while you're there uh, in the galleries, make sure you um, look for the iPads that are tethered to some of the furniture because um, we have this uh, platform uh, that was developed by our, our team at the museum, um, open source, and it's uh, a way for us to share some deeper content with, uh, with our visitors, so check that out. I think there's even tours of that. So let's see. Okay, so I think everyone at this conference would uh, agree this is a really exciting time to be involved in museum work, right? Yes, especially photographers. We've seen incredible change over the last uh, you know, 10, 15 years. I mean, many of us here I know started with film, worked uh, through digital on a steep learning curve and fast learning curve, and now some really incredible developments are happening with computational imaging and 3D imaging, which seems to be the next uh, stage for us. Um, but um, our goals are, are basically the same, share as much information as possible with our visitors about our collection. And with 3D, we certainly have a greater potential to do that. Um, there's, uh, you know, more, just simply more information about form, volume, measurement, texture. And uh, we've been fortunate to make some uh, progress in this over the last uh, few months. I just wanted to mention um, some of the things that have helped us get there. First of all, we have an administration that's really been encouraging uh, us to you know, take risks, experiment, and uh, they've been very supportive, even, even bringing trustees and some of our community partners behind the scenes to uh, learn about what we're doing, which led to some very uh, generous support and gifts from some people in terms of equipment and training that really helped us jumpstart this project. Um, and, uh, you know, this kind of photography, more than any other capture method that we've done in the past, is much more, it takes more time, more processing, more teamwork overall, which requires more um, sp special expertise. And one thing that we've been very fortunate uh, to have this over this last year was a relationship with uh, two professors, uh, Seth Barrier from the University of Wisconsin and Gary Meyer from the University of Minnesota, who've really, sh um, you know, are doing, uh, you know, on the leading edge of, of research in, in computer graphics and uh, some of this uh, uh, technical imaging that have really, um, they've, they've shared their knowledge with us. They've helped, they even shared a graduate student with us this summer who worked in the studio, helped us get our, our, our device, our robot, up and running, and they wrote some pretty amazing extensions to the uh, commercial software we were using which they will talk more about, and I think you're going to be pretty impressed with the results. Um, but uh, first, I'm going to introduce my colleague, Charles Walbridge. He's going to go first. And uh, Charles has really led the way in this. He has a, his, his natural curiosity for technology, uh, as, uh, and his, um, he just jumped headfirst into this and has really done a lot of work, um, which you'll get to see right now. So Charles, you ready to start? Hey, thanks, Dan. Hi, hi, you guys. Welcome to Minneapolis. Um, so I have to share with you this, this project that we did with the University of Minnesota. So we have been, um, Andrew, will you focus that? Or is, oh, did Andrew move? Oh, there he is. Focus that. That's going to bug me. Um, so we've been doing computational imaging for a few years, and uh, that's Okay, I won't look at it. I'll look at mine. Um, <laughs> we've, we've been doing computational imaging for a few years, and, and we've started with reflectance transformation imaging, where you take uh, a fixed artwork and a fixed camera and move the light around, and then you can build this big file where you can virtually move the light around to get raking light and specular highlights and all this great stuff out of it. Um, so we've, we, we really started with that. And we have been sharing these, um, these really simple scans of, relatively simple scans of things that I can go up in the gallery and scan with my iPad with the little iSense scanner. Um, and it's nice because it gives you, I can, 
I can go up in the morning and, and scan this thing, which is six feet tall, and send it off to their servers and then come back and make the model and put it up on Thingiverse where people can make three, uh, 3D prints of it um, later that morning. And so it's a really quick way for us to get art out there and share it. And, and it's great because we have all this public domain art and we just we want to get the stuff out there. And when I made the screenshot last week, I could see there were 1,048 people had looked at this. And I just put it up there. I just made this up. So what's that? That one. Um, so we met Professors Meyer and Barrier at least a couple of years ago after Gary Meyer went to a talk that one of our curators gave and, and asked like what we were doing. Um, they were uh, working with 3D data, as they are now, and, um, and we've been sharing photos with them almost since the beginning. Um, we shared with them some pictures we took on a, on a homemade turntable that we had. We were working on this kind of old school QTVR kind of workflow where you uh, turn the turntable by hand and, and take a bunch of pictures. And we did first this one elevation, and then I gave them, after they requested it, three different elevations. And they made these incredible models out of what I now know is a really simple set of photographs. So we knew that uh, the potential was there. And you know, at the same time, I'd been uh, scanning this stuff with this. Um, there's also photogrammetry software that you can have on your iPad. And you can go and, and take this little dragon and put it on the table in the studio and, and take a bunch of pictures of it and also either get a good result or just get something that's horrible. Um, but so I had been learning about photogrammetry, and I knew that um, that we had great potential with this um, with this collaboration. And um, earlier th earlier this year, we had two good things happen, and and that's that I went out to Cultural Heritage Imaging in San Francisco for their photogrammetry training, and that really got my knowledge of the of the whole like what photogrammetry can do. It just took it up to another level. And we got um, money from one of our trustees to get this piece of equipment. And it's a, um, it's a turntable, and, and it's a swing arm. And so the camera moves in space. I have a video of this in a second. But the camera moves around a fixed point, so you can tell it to take 36 pictures and move up a few degrees and take 36 more and, and so on. So you get, end up getting, um, uh, here, I'll run this. Um, you end up getting between. Hold on. 250 and 750 pictures of an object. So we, we do 36 and move up and 36 and move up and, and all the way up. Um, so we've got, we're just now figuring out, actually we, we have now figured out that workflow. Sorry, that was, it's a short video. Um, and coincidentally, we're in the middle of doing uh, this huge show of all of these Chinese bronzes. It's slated actually for 2017. Um, so we have this perfect group of test subjects. They're, they're all ancient bronzes, so they're all beautiful, and they're all matte. They, they don't, they're not too sparkly, which photogrammetry couldn't handle, and um, they're all the right size to fit on the turntable. Um, so this summer, we started talking to Professor Meyer about getting one of his uh, PhD students to, to come into the studio and, and work with us for the summer. Um, and we had our biggest bronze gallery closed at the same time because there, there were these scholars here um, looking at all of the art. And they were, um, it was easier to close the whole gallery than to bring them individual things. So they actually boarded up the gallery. And these guys worked in it for months. Um, we told, this is uh, Yang Lu, our Chinese art curator in the middle, and we told him what we, kind of the requirements for photogrammetry as we understood them, and he selected 40 bronzes for us to, to run through this process. Um, so we thought that collaboration with the U would be a, a good idea, because we would give the computer scientists all this new scan data to work with, and we would figure out this turntable from somebody that actually knew 3D stuff. Um, We've never done a research uh, project like this on this scale, but it seemed like it would work. So we had these objectives of the, um, for the project, and I'll let you read this. Um, we, we wanted to make sure that we came up with data sets, and we wanted to make sure that we had a good documentation of the entire process. I don't know if that's going to work. I'll give you the slide. <laughs> 
And then there's a whole bunch of stuff that we didn't get to because we were dreaming big. You know, we're, we're trying to figure out if we could build a little virtual museum this summer and put all our stuff in it. And, and of course, that's going to take years. Um, and nobody's really talking about the kind of color management that we do in, um, you know, for fine art reproduction in into photogrammetry. And so that's a, that's a really big thing that we're just starting to even think about. But one of the things we worked out really early with um, with our guys from the U, our computer scientists, is that if we could flip these objects over and do the undersides of them as well, the, the photogrammetry software would really do well at having all those extra points to, um, to, to work with. And so on every object that we have that will tolerate it, we uh, flip it upside down. And one of the things, one of the problems that's still unresolved is that we don't know what lighting is going to be best because the, the conventional wisdom with photogrammetry turntable lighting is that you get the flattest light that you can possibly get so that the software doesn't confuse shadows with depth and then you get a good model out of that. But we found that in um, later renderers like the one that Seth has, you could do like actual studio lighting, like nice lighting with your object on the turntable build a model out of that, and then when you're looking at it, you'll get much, just much more flattering turns and everything. It won't look as, as plastic as, as I'm used to seeing these 3D models. Let's see if that's it, okay. And then the other um, problem that arose, you can see this is a, a base with um, a set of with rings right here, and when you photograph it right side up and upside down, the rings move, and so we're fine, we found quickly that we had to edit these objects, you know, we'd have to take out one set of the rings, but then we could still get the full, you know, 360, um, even with that out. So there's more editing in there than we thought we were going to get. And then I'm going to have to read this to you, because this is a dialogue box from PhotoScan that says, 2% done, 20 hours elapsed, eight, 815 hours ago. <laughs> <laughs> and we're, we're getting better. We have a fast uh, PC to, to run it. And um, one of our other recent gifts from, from a, a local company and also somebody who's on our board of trustees is a, a supercomputer that has a terabyte of RAM. And so it's in our server room. And so we're going to throw a couple of, <laughs> we're going to throw a couple of these at it and see what it can do. And for the data sets that we did for the U of M, we made sure this is a jade brush pot that's you know half the size of an ice cream bucket. And photogrammetry right now cannot do jade. And so we wanted to give these data sets to the U and, and see what they could do with them. Because these guys are thinking about translucency and uh, um, Probably not transparency yet, but but things like that 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 so far photogrammetry isn't able to do. And I don't know what they're going to do with a modernist base, but um, it's kind of iridescent, and so I don't know how the programs are going to figure this out. But these guys are better at that. Um, we have had success with gold sparkly objects. This is a pretty matte gold, and um, before we had our computer scientists, I never would have tried this on a, on a turntable because, or for anything related to photogrammetry, because with the bright, bright highlights, the photogrammetry software gets confused about where the, where the surface actually is. But we made a good model out of it, and one of the ways we did it for photographers is we kind of HDR'd it. We, we took the highlights way down and the shadows way up, and now that I'm understanding more about the, the renderers that these guys have, I'm understanding that we could now take regular contrast pictures, you know, where the gold is gold and sparkly, and we could put those back into the model so we could wrap those around this model. So we did about 50 things with our, with our project this summer, so I feel like we've got a really good um, handle on what our turntable and what photogrammetry can do. And we haven't built all of these things because it's taken forever and there's a lot of human time involved. So we're building them as we can. But um, boy, it's a, it's a brave new world. And then this is the first thing that I built in Photoshop 3D. So this is a, this is a little Chinese owl that's this big.
that I had a really good 3D scan of, and I was learning about um, Photoshop's capabilities. So I found a gallery view from one of our contemporary galleries and dropped this in. And, and I think this has got a ton of potential where we can visualize this stuff and, and you know, in a couple of years where, well, actually an animator could do a fly around of, of this stuff, and so we're, there's a lot of design possibilities for this. Also, it's super cool to see that little tiny owl, <laughs> that big. Um, but I, I really think that in a, in a few years we're going to be able to, to look back at these old days when we were doing all these still photographs and say, but was that really it? Was that all we had to work with in, in those days? How did we ever learn about our objects? Even, even paintings we're going to be able to, to do this with and, and get much better you know, ideas of, of what the surface looks like. So, so it's been a really good collaboration that we've done with the U, and, and I hope that, that all of us have learned a lot from it. So that's it. You ready, Seth? And it's totally there. You can switch. Oh, thank you, Charles. Um, so ultimately, um, a little bit about me, first of all. Um, I'm practically a Minnesota native at this point. I spent 10 years here in the Twin Cities um, uh, working with Professor Meyer. Um, and so that was how I had this connection here. And now I've gone off not too far away, just, just across the, the river into western Wisconsin where I teach. But um, the connection that we had here um, was, was the, the, at the minute that I saw what they were doing in their photography studio, um, I knew there was potential for all of us to benefit from um, not just the problems that they were trying to solve, but these beautiful objects that were coming out of it. Um, as, a, as a researcher, while, while I, I certainly appreciate um, the, the, the importance of, of novel ideas and coming up with uh, new techniques, sometimes when you, you see the kind of data that comes out of cultural heritage objects, I, I, I feel myself very inspired to want to take old techniques and make them something entirely new. Now, I say old techniques because this is stuff that has been around forever. Um, at, at least in terms of computer science. Um, that um, dates back to the 90s, which is eons ago for us. Um, but we finally see the connections now um, to, to what has made its way into cultural heritage in the form of photogrammetry to this rendering that we know how to do um, that is really powerful and has yet never made it out of the lab except in a few choice special effects and movies. Um, so the, the key term here, I think, um, is computational photography. Everybody feels pretty comfortable with that as a, a sort of blanket term that carries a lot of things under it. Um, and, and photogrammetry is part of that. Um, and this idea of making 3D models from images of an object is part of that. And it all comes mostly out of computer vision. Um, However, computer graphics, which is different from computer vision, has had a lot to say in that field as well. Um, and there's an entire subset of, um, of uh, computational photography um, that has not really yet come out of the closet. And I, it's called uh, the area of light fields and light field rendering. And this was the potential that we saw. We saw the power of light fields pairing up really, um, really professionally with photogrammetry and the data that it had to supply. So I'm going to give you a quick primer in light fields. Some people have heard the term. Um, you've seen it thrown around in some uh, products out there. But really understanding what it is, I think, uh, really makes it clear how good of a connection we have between the data that comes from photogrammetry and um, the rendering possibilities here. Um, so when I say eons ago, here, here's uh, some of the original setups. Um, again, 90s, 1990s, where this is happening. Um, was sort of the original inception of two mutually published papers that, that used the term light field and were doing similar kinds of work. Very similar to what you do with photogrammetry. Taking many photographs of an object um, from several angles and then trying to process that, process that in such a way that you could render it. Now the original goal wanted to render these without having to create a model. They didn't want to have a 3D mesh because that seemed um, impossible at the time, the idea that you could even make a mesh from just this data. And so some of the original representations, it's classically referred to as the two-plane light field, um, didn't have any model in it at all. There was no surface or, or mesh that, that you could uh, use with all of this. Um, and so it was a very different sort of representation um, than what you get out of photogrammetry. But the goal was the same, to take the original images and simply show you the object as realistically as possible so you could move it and rotate it and see it from angles that, it, that existed in the real world. 
Um, this still exists today, um, even though it's taken on a very different form. How many people here have seen the Lytro cameras? Yes, this is, this is probably the commercial product that came out of the two-plane representation and is still growing. Um, it's a very interesting. It, it's a, a type of camera that captures a two-plane light field in a single click. Um, for me, this is a great research tool. I'm very interested in how this can also pair with photogrammetry, but that's an entirely another story. Uh, but these are fun to play with, and this is one uh, aspect that has come out of sort of the original idea behind light fields. Um, one very big change happened, though. After a while, they started to realize the best way to handle light field rendering was to have some geometry, to have a surface. Um, the, when you have the actual 3D model of the object, then you can, when you go back to the original photographs, you can much more accurately map them to where they were in the original scene. Um, it's kind of like a projector, um, just like this projector. Each image gets projected back onto the object. Um, and when you do that, you can very cleverly combine the images in such a way that you see exactly what you should have seen from that angle. Just like a 3D model, it's completely continuous. You can grab it and spin it all around, see it from every angle, but you don't just see a flat texture on it anymore. You see exactly what it should have looked like from that angle, or as close as you can get from the images that are available. Um, this is some examples from the works that really pushed into the surface light field area, um, where they were capturing objects um, here that's side by side. We have the original object and then the light field rendered object. Um, and then this is an entirely light field rendered object of a bonsai tree where they were trying to capture objects that have very fuzzy outlines and edges. Very difficult normally for photogrammetry to deal with that fuzziness, um, and they had great success with it. Again, most of this never found any, any use outside of the research lab. Further than that, um, a representation that we use the most um, is the unstructured lumograph. Um, and this is just the idea here, the term unstructured means um, uh, sample data that was not taken in a regular or very carefully structured manner. Um, basically, you walk around with a handheld camera and take photos and take as many as you can. Um, what I never, what I, the sort of epiphany moment that I had with this was about a year ago when I realized you could do the same thing with photogrammetry. And while it's very nice to have the really expensive turntables that can do this all precisely, the amazing thing is it's not a requirement. You can go very far with this walking around with a handheld camera. And while we have things like 123D Catch that try and make that as popular as possible, um, the really powerful tools shine in this area. We found using PhotoScan that you could take unstructured, handheld photographs and get back a marvelous result in the end, um, one that was very detailed and had exactly the data we needed. Um, so ultimately, um, our goal in all of this was to try and bridge this gap. We see the same data in photogrammetry that we want in light field rendering. Um, and the real question becomes, how do we then put the two together? Can we start with an object that was photographed with the intention of making a photogrammetric model, a 3D model, using standard tools like PhotoScan um, or, or um, uh, the Recap or, or the, the other popular tools that are out there, and then render it as a light field? Um, and it turns out this was remarkably easy. Um, Here's a typical kind of photogrammetry setup, sort of stylized in our own way here, um, where we have the object in the center, and ideally, we've always pitched this such that you would want to move the camera around in the scene and keep the light fixed. And of course, that's usually not practical, and usually you end up moving the object and keeping the camera fixed. The object will move on a turntable, but ideally, we'd like to move the camera and keep the object as fixed as possible. Um, but the input are just all of the different photographs that you take at all the various angles as you move around. Um, this object. Um, the light in this case usually stays fixed as opposed to RTIs where the camera stays fixed and the light is moving. What's the result here? Well, it's a whole bunch of photographs, um, somewhere between 100 to 700, just depending on how far you're willing to go with it. Um, uh, the important thing to note, though, is that they are just photographs. There's no extra information. We don't know where the camera was. We don't know anything about the visual properties of the object. They are simply photographs. And from that, um, uh, here's sort of our guiding um, uh, eyes on this. Uh, this gets you about maybe 150 or so photos. Um, this was the approach we tend to take, which getting to, that's getting to be the lower end of what you do for photogrammetry. Um, and all of this then gets processed by what are actually some really complex cutting edge computer vision algorithms. Um, this for me was also a real revelation, seeing that some of the stuff from computer vision had made its way out into a really useful product. Um, and yet the parts that computer graphics offers, where it finally makes a picture of this, we're still lagging behind. Um, with all of this, of course, um, those that have done photogrammetry know you get a wonderful triangle mesh, usually in the millions of triangles on the object, depending on how long you're willing to wait. Um, and then calibrated photographs. 
Now this is the part that often gets forgotten. All of those photographs that came in are now known. We know exactly where the camera was. We know exactly how the lens distorted the light. We know everything we need to do exactly what this projector is doing and reproject that image out of the camera back out to where it was originally. And that's what we needed. So um, yes, you get detailed geometry. Sometimes you get a beautiful but very flat looking color texture to put on the model. Um, but you also get all the camera information, what we would call in the field intrinsic and ex extrinsic properties of the camera. Um, so this, this was the potential. Um, for unstructured lumographs, or just unstructured light fields in general, you're going the other way around. You have all the camera information and positions, and like I described before, you're just projecting it back onto the surface. And the algorithm, all it has to do is combine the images in just the right way so that you get a pixel value that looks as close to what it would have looked like in person. And as long as the materials are well behaved, you can simply blend the, the views that you do have to create a view that you don't. And unlike um, the old school QuickTime VR approach where you were able to rotate things, there's no jerkiness as it moves from view to view. Everything is completely smooth and it has the fluidity of a 3D object. So how does unstructured light field rendering work? Um, well, you have not just photographs, but calibrated photographs. You need to know exactly where the cameras were um, because you have to be able to basically undo what the camera did and project it back into the scene. You also need surface geometry. The geometry is important because it needs to hit something when it projects back into the scene. It's kind of like painting a matte object in the middle with all the images that are around it. So um, this is typically hard to get. Very often, um, research institutions will spend uh, millions of dollars to set up custom gantry systems and calibrate them carefully so they know exactly where each camera is. And when they cap capture those views, they capture the calibration data right along with it. Um, it, this is a pretty big barrier to entry into this research field. Um, you bring that into the un unstructured lumograph rendering algorithm, which combines them um, in an intelligent manner. And the end result is an interactive 3D object that has much more realistic appearance properties than your typical um, photogrammetric object. So um, the output here, the main benefit is the realistic materials and lighting. It's no longer a flat sort of plastic looking texture. It's one that behaves the way the real material did in person. And I think these bronzes that we, we got to work with with the MIA really highlight how, how powerful that can be for some objects. So here's those two workflows placed side by side. If you haven't seen it already, the connection here is really quite simple. The calibrated photographs we get from photogrammetry are the input to lumograph rendering. The triangle mesh is the other input. And Really, the most difficult thing here was just coming to grips with the formats all the output was in. We were working specifically with PhotoScan because we saw that it was powerful and that it gave us that sort of nerdy backend we really wanted. It gave us the formats we wanted to work with, um, and their developers were very open with us. Um, we could go ask a question in the forum, and we'd hear back from the senior developer about something that would help us figure out exactly how we could get work around whatever problem we were having. Um, so I think the best way to appreciate this in the end is to see it in action. Um, so we're going to go back to this. This is one of the bronze artifacts of Bell um, uh, that the MIA uh, did for us. And this is initially just the flat photograph. And then here we turn on the light field rendering. And now you'll see it catches the highlight. And immediately we realize, oh, that's bronze. Um, before, at the beginning of this, it didn't necessarily give us that impression. Um, it looks flat, almost plastic, like the material properties don't shine through until we have the light field rendering. Here's another example. This is the end result of those turntable photographs that Charles gave us to begin with. Now, initially here, it's flat. This is just the flat texture. And then here we turn on the light field rendering. And notice the highlight that tells us this is metallic. This has a glossy sheen to it. Um, one thing that surprised me in working both with photogrammetry and with light field rendering is that glossiness, I think, has a bit of a bad rap. Yes, it has a limit. Shiny things are eventually going to mess with the algorithm, but you can push it further than you might think. We have one example data set on our, our website that um, is a, a really shiny, glossy bird that was a garden statue that I just shot because I thought it was interesting. And I didn't expect it to work, and it did. It worked out perfectly. The end rendering is very plausible. Um, I, I think as we come together, I'm ultimately realizing we don't have to be as shy about shiny things as long as we're willing for it to occasionally fail. Sometimes we're not. But This object, this is actually a hat. It bears some explaining. Um, this is a modern art piece that um, is in the Goldstein Museum of Design at the University of Minnesota. It's satin, all these ribbons, and it has this metallic cord in the background. And until here, when we turn on the light field rendering, you can't perceive any of that. 
Um, it almost does look like it's plastic. Let me do that one one more time here. Um, so the typical output is just a flat texture. Um, as you move it around, the light doesn't change. It can't, um, because all we have is the flat color data at every point. Here, once we turn it on, the satin sheen starts to come out. And as we rotate it, we see the play of the light on the surface. And we see that metallic cord underneath giving us the sparkly highlight. So for us, this was um, a, a powerful idea. We, we ultimately saw really quickly this wasn't that hard to go from one to the other. So um, we, we sort of approached this originally. We got interested in light field rendering. Not so much, um, in fact, we, we discovered the photogrammetry connection long after we were already working in light field rendering. What we liked about light field rendering is that it starts with the photographs, the original photographs of the object, and it comes back to something that is digital and malleable, um, that we can take all of our shared knowledge in computer graphics and try and do something interesting with. We're very interested um, in looking forward um, to what we can do with this under the hood, how we can manipulate these objects differently because um, they're in a digital form. Um, and we've explored one, one such direction here. This is just one concept we saw that was sort of low-hanging fruit that we thought um, this would be something interesting we can do with this. Now, I'm going to talk a little bit about a computer graphics technique, again from the 90s. Um, morphing, image morphing. It's usually something everybody's been exposed to in some, some form. Um, you all may remember the Michael Jackson black and white video. That's kind of the popular one where all the faces were melting from one person to the next. They did that with image morphing. Um, what we saw is we have a bunch of images. If we had two different objects, we could morph the individual images and come up with something in between, something that has a little bit of one object and a little bit of the other. Um, so let me illustrate for you how we do this. Here's two objects. They were, these were just chosen because they have nice, simple shapes. It's easy to understand what we're doing with these. These are artificial objects. Um, and we placed down on each of these some data points where we said, this point on the left goes with this point on the right. And we created a mapping between the two objects. Now, this process takes some time. We actually laid these down with just some algorithms. We found this circularity and, and laid them down a lot easier. But once you have those points on there, we take each of those points back into the 2D space. We go to the images. Remember, all those images that we gather of the object, that's the real representation. Um, we also, we project them onto the original images, but also onto an image that says how far away the object was, what we would call a depth image. Um, think of a connect. Connects gather this information. When they scan you, they tell you how far away you are. Um, we create that synthetically, and we put all those dots on it. And when we put all those dots on each individual image, we create literally an image morph. Um, we just move the dots regularly. We connect them up in a sort of triangle mesh. And as they move, they bend and distort the object from one to the other. And you get a nice, smooth transition from one object to the other. Um, now, in the midst of all of this, we have to go from the images back to a 3D structure. This was something that took us a little while to wrestle with. If we'd had photogrammetry, then I think it would have made a big difference. But at the time, we were doing it differently. We ultimately created a huge set of what would be called a point cloud. And then we fit polygons to that to come up with some sort of middle thing. So here's our sort of middle ground cone barrel um, um, morphed idea. And then again, just like before, we take all the images and we project them back onto that surface. And we get sort of the hybrid barrel cone here. Um, so, so ultimately, um, this is sort of represents one way we can take what were classic computer graphic algorithms that know how to operate on digital objects and put them to task to something different. We're still looking for the perfect example here of how this could be useful. Um, one of the things I love about the collaboration we've had with the MIA is that it's a lot of potential. Um, these objects are inspiring, and all the things that they do are very, um, very much give us ideas to connect things that we haven't seen before. Um, it gets us out into new areas. Um, and here, here we're morphing between two pumpkins, by the way, is what we're doing. Um, and, and so all of this collaboration ultimately pushes us in, in different directions. Um, this connection that we found, um, we, we're still looking for the perfect sort of maybe curatorial use for this or examination use as we morph between one object or another. Here we've taken the bell and the vase. And through that same process I've just shown you, we map them from one to the other. We can look at shape evolution over time. We could look at maybe material changing over time if we were able to have samples from different time periods. We could look at the changing motifs that are in use on this over time. So digital manipulation opens up all kinds of exploration avenues. And, and this was just one that we went for because it, it seemed like a fairly obvious algorithm to place into this context. 
Um, so this is something we've explored now, um, and all the potential that we've gained out of this. Um, it was, there's a lot of avenues open, but ultimately the big thing that we've done is put together this software. I'm going to jump past this guy. He's fun, but in the interest of time. Um, we, you have to have a different renderer to render these, and we've written one, created one that is very specific to um, this tool, as designed around using um, uh, PhotoScan, and when the data comes out of PhotoScan, we can we can grab it and process it really quickly and render it in our own light field renderer. Um, we've designed this with the idea of putting it out there for everyone to use, um, and ultimately today this is what we want to do. Um, we're going to make this publicly available. It uses all open source technologies. Um, it requires a substantial computer, but something in the range of what I'm on right here, a, a decent laptop from the last couple of years is enough to run this um, and deal with reasonably sized objects. We're very interested in seeing what you guys can do with this. Um, it can take any model you've done in PhotoScan, and we're, we're still finding some fringe objects that need some bugs squashed, um, but it can take those models and render them in the ways that I've just shown you. And if you're interested in trying this out, um, you just need to go to ULF Renderer on Google Sites, um, or send an email to ULF Renderer at Gmail, and I'll point you to the right place. Um, the purpose of this is ultimately to try and put this visualization tool and this digital management tool in your hands or digital rendering tool in your hands and see what other ideas are out there that we could do with this and where else we might grab some ideas from computer graphics and really put them to good use. Um, so if you're interested in this, please contact me afterwards or, or, and we'll be more than happy to put you in touch with it. I should emphasize it is sort of alpha software at this point. It does crash. We are still working to fix bugs and we have found some models that come out of PhotoScan that still don't want to render correctly. But with your help, we can turn it into, hopefully, a, a very robust tool um, that, that we can put out there for other people to visualize things. Um, our ultimate goal is to work with, um, uh, with cultural heritage imaging. We've arranged a partnership with them to put this side by side with their RTI tools. Um, and um, once we've gotten through all the major testing and the kinks worked out, is our intention to make this another tool in the tool belt um, for digital curation. Okay, we'll have more so, time until we yes. Get so, that's what we're doing now. Now to talk about what we can do in the future, I'll hand it over to Professor Meyer. Okay, so what I'd like to uh, talk to you about today is I want, I want to introduce you to what I think is kind of a leading edge topic in this, in this problem of photogrammetry. That's basically acquiring and relighting spatially varying reflectance. And I'll kind of show you where we're going in my research lab to build on the software that Seth just showed you. Uh, to start this, I want to just give you kind of an idea of what I mean by the term spatially varying reflectance. So across the bottom here in the foreground is actually a sheet of paper that's specially printed to change the reflectance properties from the left to the right side. And in fact, you can see that on the left-hand side, it's more mirror-like, and on the right-hand side, it's more diffuse, because you can tell on the left-hand side does a better job of reflecting the checkerboard that's behind it. On the right-hand side, it can't do that. And the, and the reflectance properties change uniformly as you move from left to right. So it's, by definition, a spatially varying reflectance. And the important thing here is it's not so much about the color. It's how the light reflects spatially off the surface. So on the left-hand side, the light's going to go off more in what we call the mirror direction, almost exclusively in the mirror direction. On the right-hand side, it's going to spread itself off generally out, out into the environment. That's the difference between something that's specular and something that's diffuse. And the world's museums are full of such objects. This is a, 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 shoulder, uh, a shoulder pad or uh, artifact from uh, the British Museum. It's on the bottom there. And it's a, it's a gold cloisonne. And you can see in this that even the gold itself has got slightly different reflectance properties over here than it does over here. And of course, the, the precious materials that are in the interstices are also very different in their reflection properties. And so what we want to be able to do is capture those spatially varying reflectance properties. And this is a leading edge topic in computer graphics. And I'm going to show you what we're doing in this field and also show you that you know, this is what's just on the horizon for you and potentially going to appear commercially in the software available to you. Now, people have been trying to solve this problem for 
probably uh, 15 years or more. And largely it has involved the use of specialized instrumentation to acquire this kind of data. The problem is that you have to light the thing from all directions and photograph it from all directions to have the most general capture process that you could have. This is an example of one device that was built to capture such properties from flat materials like this, this vellum. Um, here's another one that was built as a dome. And even it's hard to tell in this, but those are all cameras, all pointed down <laughs> on the same point in space. And there's also a light that's associated with every one of those cameras. So they can photograph it from every direction and, and also light it from every direction. Here's a more recent piece of apparatus built to deal with materials that have very specular and, and even color shifting kinds of properties. This is a, a linear light that's being uh, flung around the outside of this at such high speed that it becomes a blur and looks like a globe surrounding this, providing very unique lighting patterns and then being photographed here on the right-hand side. Now, you know, but as, as, as impressive as that, as that is, the very first attempt to do this, or one of the very first attempts to do this, was a polynomial texture map, or more commonly known as RTI. And you can get a long way towards having spatially varying reflectance for specific types of surfaces if you use this technique, which is widely used in the cultural heritage field. And this just demonstrates to you, across the bottom is what happens if you take and just make yourself a texture, one shot of this little uh, mosaic of peanuts, and light it different, as you light it differently, the texture is unable to show you the spatial properties, the, the, the kind of shape and form, and even the kind of reflectance properties that those objects have. If you use a polynomial texture map, you're going to replace every one of those little pixels in that texture with information about the reflectance properties. And while this, and this is a technique that's heavily used in, in the cultural heritage and the museum fields, and you can anticipate, you know, within the next five to 10 years, that all textures will carry with them this kind of reflectance information. You'll be able to, you know, de-res them, if you will, down to just RGB, but they'll all probably, as, as, as much as it's possible to acquire this, and it was originally available, many more textures will carry this kind of spatially varying reflectance information with them. Uh, one of the, the, in that original paper, uh, was proposed this, this uh, sphere and uh, with a hole in the top for the camera and then all these uh, strobe lights around the outside. Now, uh, people are actually manufacturing these. I'm aware from a conference, a digital uh, heritage conference I went to, you know, they're actually taking this thing out into the field in a little compact uh, briefcase kind of setup, and maybe some of you even in this audience are aware of and making use of this device. Um, we've done some work with the Minneapolis Institute of Art on this, and there's, this is uh, Charles in the foreground here. And, you know, as many of you know, you don't have to go to those lanes. You have to build such a dome. If you're clever, as Charles is very clever, you know, you can build yourself a, a little rig like this that gives you one cross-section of that dome in terms of lights, and the camera is up here mounted on the, on the stand, and we're photographing this particular Rembrandt etching, and we're using some of the little spheres that available from the Cultural Heritage uh, Imaging Organization in San Francisco. The little white spot on there tells us in the photograph the direction to each one of the light sources. Now, what we've done in this area uh, has been, uh, we did, in fact, uh, you know, work with some different fitting techniques so that we can do a better job of fitting the reflectance model to the image data and improve the representation that we get for certain types of um, artifacts. Uh, we've also done some work with high dynamic range imaging where, we pho where the photographs we take are not just um, single photographs from each, uh, each time, but we take a series of photographs and then that way capture a larger dynamic range of the reflected light from the surface, which is useful when you have something like this, which has very dark matte areas and then highly specular areas. The, the work that we've done most with the RTIs and the polynomial varying texture maps is to relight them 
using environment maps. So instead of having just a single point light source that you're moving around, what we want to be able to do is insert the object into an environment map to capture you know, the kind of lighting that you would have in an ordinary environment of some kind. And the idea is, is fairly simple, but you have to reduce that map to a series of little point lights that are each going to contribute some amount to the reflection and, and appearance of that object. But the points can't be uniformly distributed. They have to show, they have to be more dense where there's more light, like the skylight, and less dense or in the background where the walls are dark, for example. And if you do that, uh, you can take this, this, this Syrian tablet and show what it would look like in a gallery. So this is, in fact, a, a gallery at the Minneapolis Institute of Art. Seth, Seth took this environment map picture. Then we could move it into a different gallery uh, in the same museum. Um, and you can see the difference is subtle. But you can, if you look at what happens, you know, there's a difference in color temperature between something like the skylight for the natural light and the artificial light in this museum. Museum lighting, for the most part, is intended to be fairly uniform, so that also diminishes the differences that you see moving it from one place to another. But you know, nothing limits the kind of lighting setup you can use uh, when you use this, this approach. For example, you can put it into a photographic studio which has aerial lights with gels and actually light it, you know, with, it with colored lights and actually show that kind of variation. You can take it outdoors and show it in a, a lighting situation with the sun in the sky, also illuminated by the sky. You can, put, you can rotate the object and not just the environment map to show what it would look like from different, uh, in different orientations in that environment. Or, for example, um, you could show a time lapse kind of thing where you sequence through a series of environment maps where the sun is moving across the sky, the clouds are changing, you know, show what would happen to how that artifact would look at sunrise as the sun gets to its uh, height, height in the sky and then, and then comes back to sunset. All that's possible using this kind of environment mapping technique. Um, as Charles has mentioned, uh, we've been working with the, with the Minneapolis Institute of Art and one of my students has worked with Charles this summer uh, with the photo robot. And uh, besides helping them kind of work, do, make better use and more efficient use of some of the commercially available tools, you know, we're working on advanced algorithms to process the imagery that's acquired using the photo robot. And some of this work, I'm going to show you uh, some, some stuff that's just hot off the presses. Um, working with the, with the, with the photographers, you know, we've been inspired to seek a representation which preserves the photographic representation of the original images, but adds enough reflectance information to allow the object to be relit. And I want to show you some of these results. So here's one of the Chinese vessels. And we're rotating it around just as, as Seth rotated the other, the Chinese vessel in his example. But here, the lighting is not baked onto the surface. If you look at the highlight, it's shifting and moving across the surface because the light is fixed and the object is moving synthetically with respect to that light source. Okay? We can do other relightings of this object. For example, uh, choose a more dramatic lighting, or even you know, choose unusual colored lightings uh, for various purposes. Now, I have to emphasize, you know, this is not photography at this point. This is the result of taking those pictures, processing them, turning them into a model, and then relighting them artificially. Here's another uh, object that you saw previously that Charles referred to in, in trying to capture the geometry of this object. And you can see, as you rotate it around, um, this is an object that has, clearly has a, a very shiny finish to it. But there are parts of it, the tail, the rider's hair, the mane of the horse, which have a different, slightly different patina to them. And in a moment, I'll show you some close-ups of it. You can see there are parts of it that are worn. 
and have also a different kind of surface finish due to that, due to that aging process. We can relight it, even create kind of unusual and dramatic relightings of it. I'll show you here a, a close up. As it comes around, you can see the tail, you see the spot just to the left of the tail, which is kind of a, a worn area, which really has a very different kind of surface reflection property to it. And finally, this, this kind of view of the head. Now, the, the, you know, the face of the horse, if you look at it carefully, it's got these kind of wear areas on it. Um, and it's kind of a, a, good, a good place to look for this kind of spatially varying reflectance property. And finally, uh, this little uh, child's uh, tiger hat. This is a particularly interesting artifact from the standpoint of spatially varying reflectance. There are parts of this hat, if you look at it carefully, parts of the hat which have a kind of a felt and flat kind of surface reflection. There are parts of the hat which are almost metallic in terms of the way the fabric uh, reflects the light. There are silver threads in that, in, in parts of that that are you know, specifically reflecting differently than the background does. And we can relight it. You know, and even choose a relatively unusual lighting, you know, if you so desired, you know. I, and we, we're, this is computer scientists doing this, you know. We, we, <laughs> hey, don't, 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 blame, don't blame Charles or Dan for this. <laughs> This is what happens when a graduate student is allowed to play in the middle of the night. So here's, um, you know, here's a close-up of, um, you know, the, so, so look at those silver threads on that light blue background in the eyebrow. So, you know, the algorithm has to be intelligent enough to identify that that's silver versus the surrounding area, which is a matte finish. The, the seam on the front is also some kind of uh, appears to be some kind of silver foiled material, so it has a different reflectance property. And still, you know, I, you know, you see the detail of the individual threads. You know, it, it in our analysis, and we're still at the very beginning of this. You know, it seems to hold together. You know, it seems to be consistent with the original photographs, which is you know what we want to achieve, particularly for working with people, you know, in in, in the museums. And finally, this view of the hat from behind. It's really rich, you know, beautiful purple violet fabric. And even the embroidery work on the, in the middle has got some spatial variation to the, to the threads and appearance that it has. That's really nice. Thank you. Here's the guys you should really thank, and this is the most important slide. Uh, these are the two, uh, the two, the two graduate students who, who did this work, and it's it's my privilege to stand here and, and show you their work. And my colleagues Seth and Dan and Charles, and I also want to thank uh, the Minneapolis Institute of Art for their support and their access to their staff and, and their equipment. Thank you. Yeah, could someone get the lights in the back of the room? Well, thank you, Gary and Seth and Charles. I think you can see why we're really excited and grateful to be working with these gentlemen because they're doing some fantastic work, and, and we would not have made the progress we did this summer without the help of their team who came into the studio uh, to work with us. So thank you guys so much. We really appreciate it. And we have some time for questions. 
Yeah, there you go. The light switch on the right, all the way on the right, on the I right. think. The one on the right's the slider. Yeah. No, Push no, you got button. right by the little button on the slider handle. There you go. All right, good. So, anybody care to ask a question? There we go. Great. So, um, so after the photographs are processed, you know, the what we attempt to do is, you know, turn, pre figure out as best as we can information about the surface reflectance properties. So, and and then with that as an understanding and doing the kind of algorithm that this that this work does, we're able to actually take the light and relight it using that portion of the reflectance information or the amount of reflectance information that's necessary in order to, in order to render that appearance. So that's, that's basically what's going on there. Yeah, and I guess to, to emphasize, it's not, it's not that a, an artist needs to go in and say this is metal or that this is, is metallic or, or re reflective. Um, the algorithm, the rendering algorithm itself just sort of does that as part of recombining everything together. If you if you watched it carefully, um, it wasn't completely smooth, right? So there was a little bit of a little bit of a jump, uh, but 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 that was it wasn't it wasn't like it was a, you know a three hour compute to produce that animation. That was screen captured off of something that was happening in real time. So you know you could you could say the next generation of graphics card would probably take away that hesitation. Yeah, but yeah, it's it's all it's all done in real time. Well, you know, we we um, we don't have a conservation department as part of the museum. We have there is an independent group of conservators who are housed in the museum and work as a separate organization. But they're very interested in this, and um, especially with some of the RTI uh, um, work that we've done. But we don't have um, that kind of relation that we would if if they were part of the museum staff, unfortunately. Yeah, can you say the question again real quick? So instead of using the, the original layer shadowing, mm -hmm. could you merge together like the, the photographic shadowing and the aperture? Yeah, so ultimately the only shadows that, that should be showing up, I guess I can I can speak to the, the software that, that we're releasing, the, the current stuff. Um, uh, the shadowing is only what was in the original photographs. So sometimes when you catch it from certain angles, um, the, if the light produced self-shadowing where it was casting on itself, we're not adding that artificially. It is from the photographs. Um, from the newer rendering, I don't think they're computing shadows. I, it's all a matter of just computing reflectance properties. So the shadows that you do see were part of the original lighting setup when it was captured in some form. So as you move the object, if it did self-shadow itself and it cast a shadow back onto itself, um, the, it did that because the light um, did that when we captured it as well. So it's it's not being sort of artificially created. Is that accurate? Yep. yep. It's a big question, and you know the question is how long do we continue to support the uh, 
the current work for us, really, because this is really far more exciting and and um, and really more interesting. It's a more dynamic experience for the viewer. It's about as close as people are ever going to get to holding something in their hand and moving around and manipulating it. There's just m simply more information to share this way than there is with the 2D still photography. So I think, you know, um, you know, it's probably safe to say we'll be moving into this technology as it, as it develops, as uh, you know, at least I say, you know, in five, ten years, I don't know how much we'll be doing. Is it currently a standard for objects? Do you need a partner? No, really, no, it's, it's not. It's, um, it's a special project kind of uh, thing. Like we're, we're, we have this, um, this collection of pills or ancient ritual bronzes uh, that are fairly well known and we're doing um, a, a big catalog and show on it in 2017 at Charles Manson show. We're using that as like a test. But on, example. But on Monday, I did a gallery photography of a new accession that's a limestone crucifixion from 1500. And after I did the old style photographs, I did photogrammetry capture for another half hour up in the gallery. And now I have all that data that I'm going to share with the scholar who has requested, you know, she requested the regular details, you know, give me the, the cup rings or the cups of the, of the work and, and other details. But now I'm going to give her a whole, I'm going to give her those photos, but also a Uh, yeah, we're still working on some of this. I'm going to give you Carla's answer, yeah. <laughs> which, is, which is that the all of the information is contained in those original photographs. So we're always going to save our, our raw captures. But then we're also looking to archive for our asset management system maybe a 2D PDF that represents this entire project, as well as all of the all of the original captures. But then. We have stages in the building of the object where we're saving out a copy. And then, yes, we're taking, uh, we're making a text file out of the, the 3D map and some of the uh, texture files, and we're saving those separately. So we're getting as archival as we can with it right now. And there's an ISO standard that's uh, 3DX, 3XD, <coughs> whatever that abbreviation is, that, that's moving forward. I, I would add to that. Just from the computer graphics standpoint, what you said about the original um, photographs containing all the information, um, that's, I think, the most important point. You know, everything that we're doing right here with the light field rendering, we didn't add any data. We just went back to the photograph that photogrammetry is ignoring. And so it's important that you don't just save the results of the photogrammetry, that you save those original images right along with it, or we can't do anything. Mm -hmm. I would argue that you save the photograph as the highest priority because the computers are going to get better and better. Right. Yes. You can envision a day where know, five, maybe ten years, I don't know, it depends on how well Moore's Law holds up where you can press a button and it makes a 3D on demand. Well, yep. you only do that if it has original photos. Right. And we're going to get more and more out of them because what you guys are doing, other people are going to build on. So the archiving is about collecting high quality photos, some metadata about your photos, and storing that. And yes, right now we're doing some other things with it that we want to share with the public, but that's yep. not how we should be thinking in terms of the historical data, which is the well, let me make one more question. Um, so on that topic, if you're shooting, I don't know, you've got 130 images, are you using those in this format, or? The turntable workflow that we have, we're shooting with um, a 20 megapixel camera, a, five, um, a 5D Mark II, and because we can, we're capturing between 300 and 750 images of every object. So it's a lot. It, it ends up being about 10 gigabytes a session. But you don't have to do that. You but yeah. Carla would tell you that <laughs> you don't have to do that. I mean, I love what you're doing, but yes. they are over. Yeah, no I way. just about fainted when I got the first yeah. place. <laughs> yeah. We're going to use all this data. Yes, it's wonderful. Yeah. Yeah. It's yeah. Some yeah. challenges. Yeah. Yeah. It's great when you can get really yeah. great results without going right. any other results. Yeah. Well, uh, Brian, I don't know how much time. I don't know when we have to be out of the room exactly. <laughs> right. right. There's another thing at 345. At 345. So we have to move. So I know this is it. Brian, wait, wait. I just want to say real quick, incredibly, incredibly exciting work. And right now, the specular qualities, the reflection qualities, are those only viewable in a proprietary viewer? Or are they exportable as like a specular map, Adlet? 
Well, yeah, I mean, you're grabbing the microphone. There's a special, you have to have a special viewer to, to do that. Yeah. But it's yeah. about the right here. It's going to be open source. Right. At least for the part that I showed where we can turn on the light field rendering, that is open source. It's out there now, in fact. It's open source, and you can access it. And and um, the stuff that's further along in the pipeline is a part of a lot of the same code base. Um, so there's potential to do the same with that, you know, and that would be up to the, the researchers' decisions for that work. Cool. Yeah, but you'll have a chance to ask him more questions. I'm sure there'll be a lot of discussion about this in the days and years to come. And I want to say thanks to Michael Tesla, who yeah. worked with us this summer. Yes, who helped generate the last <laughs> examples there. Yeah.